truck up and put that 10 foot aluminum boat in the water and I haul my big battery and set it there, my trolling motor and get all the tackle in and for the last two or three hours of the night, the evening into the night, just put it out there and float on the water and fish for bass. It's one of my favorite things to do. Well, last year, it was December, I was doing that. They were out of town. It was a little cool out and kind of windy, unseasonably windy for that late in the evening. But I put it out there in the water, and I was just going to fish around the edges, and the wind was pushing me out into the middle a little bit. So I tried to troll my way back, but that old battery had gone out. You know, we carry those old batteries in our boats, and that thing went out, and so I'm drifting out in the middle, but I thought, no big deal, you know. I mean, I'll let the wind die down. I'll just hang out here in the middle of the lake for a while. And so I was just sort of working on my lures and stuff. And you know, just side note, that when you see a boat just sitting out on the water like that, it almost looks like water and boats are friends. They're not friends. Water hates boats. It is water's singular mission in life to push on that boat at every contact point in hopes that it can find one hole in the boat. If water finds the hole, it goes into the boat. It seeks to fill the boat and draw the boat into abyss forever. And that's what happened to me. So I'm out there floating along, and I'm working on my lure, and all of a sudden I see water gathering at my feet. And I turn around, and the the, the plug had popped out. We had tack welded. Everybody knows what that is, just a little tack weld. Well, it popped out, and I couldn't find the plug, and the water's coming in the boat, and I've knocked my lures over, and they're everywhere, and I'm trying to find my phone. It's not waterproof, and I can't get it back in. I find it. I plug it in. It pops right back out, and I am sinking on a cold December evening all by myself in the middle of a lake, and I don't know what to do, and I'm not going to make it life or death because I'm here tonight, so it would kind of ruin the ending, <laughs> but I did take that little wooden crack paddle that you're never really supposed to have to use except on your kids, And I started working my way back, and I mean, I'm making it a foot a minute, just barely, and I'm going down, just like this, and I remember cold, wet, soaked, getting back to the land, not, never been so happy to get to the land, I got lures floating everywhere, and I got back on the land. Now, if you can picture what that was like, I want you to use that imagery with me tonight, because we're going to make a connection with that story, and I'll tell you how that story ended. There's a bit of a happy ending at the end of that thing, though that was a, a low point, drifting in, soaking wet. Here's the thing. We've been talking about getting out there. Sunday, our studies were about getting out. We'll we'll use this terminology for the next few minutes. Putting your boat out on the water. Getting in the boat and getting out there on the water as if the boat is you and the water that's pushing on you is the world and all of the things that are against you. But you go out there anyway and you're trying to bring fish into the boat. That's Bible imagery. Just think about it without the treble hooks. You know, we're trying to bring people out of the water into the boat. And we've encouraged you to get out there and do that. To be visible. We talked about on Sunday three things. Number one, get out there and talk to people about God. That's casting your boat upon the water. You can't catch fish unless you get out there amongst the oppression of the world and you start talking to people about God. But we added some factors to that on Sunday. We said don't just go out there and talk to people about God, but love everybody. Love everybody you meet. Decide that everybody you meet for the rest of your life is your neighbor and deserves your attention. And be sure that as you go about this, like Jesus, that you're gentle and patient and kind with people, and understanding, and that, remember this, that you assume the lowest position in every room in which you walk. That's what it means to cast your boat upon the waters, is to share the gospel with people, love your neighbor, and be humble every step of the way. But you need to know something. The more you do that, you're bold enough to go out there all by yourself. The more you talk to people about Jesus... The more you talk to people about your faith, the more you put out there that you're about the purpose of God, the more the water will push on you. The world will notice what you're doing. People in your life will push at you because they don't like the stance that you're taking and your sort of outspokenness about your faith makes sinners uncomfortable. And so the world will stop pushing on your boat. And I have some very unfair news for you tonight. All it takes is one hole in your boat. I know it's not fair. You're sitting out there thinking, that's not fair. The world can go out there and sin all they want and do a thousand things wrong, and then they just repent one day and we all rejoice. Yeah, that's great. That's grace. But it doesn't work the other way around. 
The other way around, if your boat's on the water and you're standing for something and you're out there in the world and you're trying to make a difference, you can do a thousand things right and just mess up one time, one hole, and it can sink all of your influence. In fact, the world is looking for that. If you're on Facebook, you can post all the sermons, you can post Bible verses, you can mention God all the time, but the more you put out there how important faith is to you, the more likelihood that when you post a picture from the state fair last week, all of your worldly friends are studying to make sure your shorts come to your knees, because if they don't, you're a hypocrite. That's not fair. That's not fair that the world does that. But that's the way it works as a Christian. So here's what we have to do. We've got to put our boat on the water. Be bold and courageous. But we also have to make sure that we don't let one little hole destroy everything that we've given our lives to. Open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 22. That's where you need to be tonight. What we are studying this week is following in the footsteps of Jesus. It is easy for me to say to you that Jesus most certainly cast his boat out upon the water. He went out amidst the world when it pushed on him and sought to sink him. And he put himself out there and his entire mission from the age of 12 to his death on the cross, as far as it's recorded, was about talking about his father. Everything we studied Sunday, Jesus did. He talked to people about God. He loved every person that he met. And he assumed a low position to try to take care of their needs. And the world hated him for it. The religious world despised him. They saw that boat on the water. They did not see a beacon of hope and salvation. They saw a threat, a threat to their way of life, and they made it their mission to find one hole in Jesus' boat. How many of you know that's all it would have taken? Don't you follow Jesus because he had no sin? How many would follow Jesus if he had had one glaring sin in the middle of all of it? They wanted to find that single weakness, and that's what I want to show you tonight. If your Bibles are open to Matthew chapter 22, I'd like for you to move forward to around verse 15, please. I want you to see that the Pharisees have decided we've got to find the hole in this man's boat. And so what we're going to do is we're going to gather up our buddies. We're going to get some Pharisees together. We'll get us some Sadducees. They're Sadducee. You know all of that. And I'm going to get them, and I'll go grab some Herodians. We'll get the whole lake We'll get all the water we can, and we're going to push on him, and we're going to see if we can find something. So what I want to show you tonight are the three questions that they asked in hopes of finding Jesus' weak spot. Will you look at it with me? Let's see what comes up when I click on this. All right, there's our picture, the integrity of Jesus that he held up under the pressure. And here's the first thing. Read with me verses 15, 16, and 17. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? Boy, this is rich. First of all, just a quick note on the Herodians. They were Jews who favored the Roman government, which sounds really odd, but the Roman government put their Herods into power, and they liked that. So the Pharisees and the Herodians were not good buddies, but they had a common enemy here, and it was Jesus Christ. So they're working together, and here come these Herodians, and can you hear them just a kissing all the way up to them, verse 16? Jesus, you're so wise and smart and holy and perfect. We know that there's no flaw in you. So if you don't mind, can we just ask you a quick question? They had formulated this question to perfectly attack him in two areas. This is a two-for-one question. They get two shots at seeing about the weakness of Jesus. Here's what I'm telling you. They asked him the perfectly worded question just to see if maybe Jesus' weakness had to do with money. That's a hot-button topic. Would you agree? Money and government. Those are both kind of big deals. A long time later and an ocean away, those are still pretty big deals. So they said, check this out, verse 17. Just a quick question, Jesus. You're so wise and wonderful. Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? Now let me ask you a question. What are they hoping he's going to say? Any idea? They are hoping that Jesus will say, you see that money? That money is mine. 
I work for this money. This money's in my pocket. And I'm not, I think they honestly thought Jesus was going to go into some greed speech about how once it's yours, it's yours. They would have loved that. They could have exploited that and ended his ministry. Oh, you're following this greedy Jesus. He believes that once the money is his, nobody can ever get their hands on it. I think they were thinking that he would say something about money that showed that he was materialistic. But the real bell ringer here would be if they could get him to attack the government. Oh, that would be the one. If they could get him to simply answer, they said, is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? And Jesus said, Caesar who? There's only one king around here, and it's not Caesar. Oh, they'd have been all, I'll talk about a hole in the boat. Water would just come flooding into the boat. They could have gotten him sort of as an insurrectionist fighting against the government. They took two shots at Jesus, and here was his answer. Look with me in verse 18. But Jesus, verse 18, perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. What a great answer. Hey, grab me a piece of money real fast. Whose face is on that? That's Caesar. That's your government. They made it. They gave it to you. If they want it back, give it to them. I'm not here to collect money, Jesus is saying, and I'm not here to fight against the government. I really like what he said here when he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. I had a friend one time say that here's how he imagined this. He imagined Jesus pointing to Caesar and saying, whose inscription is that? Caesar's. Then give it to Caesar. And then he walks up and points at one of the guy's hearts and says, whose inscription is that? God's inscription is on you. You give yourself to God. Give the money to Caesar if he wants it that badly, and you give yourself to God. So this is strike one, or really, if you want to break it down, strike one and strike two. Whatever holes might be in Jesus' boat, it wasn't going to be greed, and it wasn't going to be insurrectionists. So they came back again. Go back to the text. They weren't done. They were really just getting warmed up. Now they bring in their all-star cast of Sadducees. You know about these Sadducees. They don't believe in angels or the resurrection. You've heard all about that. And so they have formulated the perfect question to stop Jesus' influence in its tracks. Let's pick up and read here. Verse 23. On that day, some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and questioned him, asking, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. Okay? Now, Jesus, there were seven brothers with us. One of them snickers. We're going to get him with this. There are seven brothers, and the first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother, and also the second and the third, down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died in the resurrection, therefore. Whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all married her. And I see the, the Sadducee going, huh? What about that? And of course, we would pull out a whiteboard, right? We'd start drawing circles and lines and dotted lines and all this. So they're taking two shots at him again. Two bites at this apple. The Sadducees are asking about two things. They're packaging their question in the context of marriage. Marriage and who you're bound to and who you're supposed to be with. But they're adding their bigger question, which is eternity. They don't believe in any of that anyway, and so they're hoping that he'll say something. What do the Sadducees hope that Jesus will say? This great teacher who's influencing so many, I think they're hoping he's going to say... I have no idea. I mean, there's all these marriages and deaths, and I can't even connect all that. You, you lost me after the second guy. I don't know. I think they're thinking that Jesus won't understand the marriage law. That would be great. Or if he said, I really don't know what's going to happen in heaven. I don't have much concept of, of if there'll be marriage in heaven or who she would be married to, so they can say, this is the one you're following? You're following a guy? who doesn't even know what heaven's going to be like, and he's supposed to be from heaven. They took two shots at Jesus, but they were questioning the wrong man if they were looking for weaknesses. Look at the text in verses 29 and following. But Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not understanding the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. 
But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? He's quoting scripture at them. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowd heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. First of all, he does know about the marriage law, but he was not going to chase that rabbit around for an hour when that really wasn't the nature of the question anyway. He said, forget that. There's no marriage in heaven. That really wasn't very well constructed. But even more than that, I know everything about heaven. I know there won't be marriage. I know that they'll be like angels. I've seen it. I've been there. And they were so astonished that there were no weaknesses in these very highly debated categories that some of them instantly stopped in their tracks. But it wasn't over yet. Those pesky Pharisees, they sent out two pawns to go first. They're Herodians. And now their usual enemies, the Sadducees, but the Pharisees have put together the perfect question. If there's a hole, any weak spot in the hull of this man's sustenance, we will find it here. And so we look in verses 34 and 35. They're very brief about it. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? in the law? Guys, it's the questions that seem mild that are the most heavily loaded. It's the one where you lower your guard and he says, okay, well, finally, a nice question. It's not. They're trying to trap him. Certainly this would get him. I wonder what they're hoping that he's going to say. I'll go ahead and tell you where I think they're going with this. The Pharisees are asking about God's law and preferences. It would be their greatest blessing if they asked Jesus If they said, what's the greatest command in the law? And Jesus said something like, you know, to be honest with you, I don't actually know the law all that well. I mean, I know a few of them, but I haven't really read the law. If Jesus would expose that he doesn't even really understand the law that he's preaching, would that stop his ministry? Just like that. You guys are following a guy that doesn't even know the laws. They were hoping he would say that. Or I think even better, even better. This is so true in our political world. And it's true with the water of the world pushing on your integrity as well. They were hoping he would make a choice. If he would just pick one of the Ten Commandments, they could twist that. If he said, well, uh, if you really put me down to it, the, the greatest commandment is honor your father and your mother. Oh, did you hear about Jesus? Jesus said all you have to do is honor your father and your mother. Jesus said it's okay to murder. Did you hear that Jesus said that? He said it's okay to steal and do all these other things because he said only one. Oh, they were just hoping he'd pick one. Please pick one so that he could show some preference and they could say, this is the guy you follow? He's inconsistent. But Jesus' answer, you know really well, I think. Jesus came back and said, all right, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And then he adds a little bonus material for them. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. I think it was Sunday I said this, but you already know this, that these five words, love God, love your neighbor, all ten commandments are wrapped up in five words. The first four commandments, love God, covers them. The last six commandments, love your neighbor, covers it. Jesus' answer was nothing short of perfection. He answered with one command that covered all the other commands. You just love God with every ounce of your life and everything else will take care of itself. After this, we may add this at the end if we have time. Jesus said, let me ask you a question. I just have to tell you in Bible times when Jesus said, that was cute. Let me ask you a question. You're in terrific trouble, terrific trouble. And they were in trouble. And his question, I don't know, even this many years later, I read it and go, wow, I I don't even know how to answer that. And I got the whole New Testament to work with. But here's the point. They were looking for weaknesses. I need to tell you something. We need to be like Jesus in a lot of different ways. One of the ways we need to be like Jesus is like him. We need to put ourselves out there. That's what we talked about Sunday. That's what we talked about in the introduction tonight. You've got to get out there. Hand out the cards. Talk about your church. Be more spiritually minded. Share things on social media. But know this. They will seek to your own family will seek to undermine your faith, and all they need is one uh, alternate fact, or whatever we're calling it in Washington. One thing, one weakness. So let me talk to you about a few things. You see them already up here. 
Let me give you a little list of six things tonight. This won't take very long to do. Just six little areas where you need to be careful. Where historically the world has done a pretty decent job of undermining a Christian's life. And here's the first one. That interesting little stuff you've got in your back pocket tonight. The Bible's pretty clear on this. I want to take you to 1 Timothy 6. I'm not going to use the verses that you're most familiar with up at the top about the love of money and longing for it. I'm pretty much paraphrasing it right now. But over in 1 Timothy, I really want to look a little further down. Not only when it says a Christian and his relationship with his money, not only does it say he's not going to live for his money, he's living for God. Not only is it going to say that he's not going to love it, he's going to love God. It actually goes on to say in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. We're all pretty good at verse 17. We applaud that. That sounds great. But then he says, instead, instruct the rich to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Oh boy, I just saw a hole pop up in somebody's boat out there. Great Christians, faithful servants, love the Lord, talk about the kingdom until it requires that they take a piece of paper out of their pocket and just give it to someone. And then we come up with 20 excuses why that's just not a wise thing to do. Here's what I'm here to tell you. If you love the Lord and you really want to make a difference, don't let greed sink you. It's a hole in people's boat. An unwillingness to give. Let me give you a quick story. A lady comes to our church last year, I think. I think the second half of last year. She comes from what we would call an institutional background. So her big question was, how are you using the funds that you collect? And we talked about how, you know, we use it for saints. And she said, so you're not using the funds for just anybody who might need it. And so I went into the speech. We've all done the speech. Ricky's done the speech. I gave her the whole, well, here's the way the Bible lays that out. And, and here's what the contribution is for. And, and we use it for this restricted purpose. Went through the whole thing. I mean, I gave her illustrations and all that stuff. And then I said... And we always said this at the end. I say, when it comes to the world and just being kind to people around us, we do that individually. You ever heard this? And out of your pockets. That's the way we help people in the world. And I was standing there with two elders, and she looked us right in the eye. Can you believe the gall of this woman? And she said, boy, that sounds great. What have you been doing with the money out of your pocket lately? I did not see that coming. Now, what I wanted to say was... Well, we've got members of the church who adopt children. Huh? We've got 10 families here at Campbell Row that adopt children. We've got three or four there that adopt children. But I was afraid she was going to look at me and say, well, I was at church Sunday, Chris, and most of your children kind of look like you. In other words, that's a nice story, but what are you doing, Chris, out of your pocket to back up what you're teaching? And I realized I'd sprung a leak in my boat. Preaching all this and then letting a little bit of greed... Get in the way of my influence. Consider this in your life and what the usage of your funds is saying about your conviction. The second thing we saw in that same first question, the Herodians not only asked about money, but all oh, they asked about government. Is this a big deal these days? Do we talk much about government? Have you made it through a single day in the last two weeks without... I mean, I'll be honest. I went through high school, college, my 20s. I couldn't even tell you how many Supreme Court justices there were. I know, it's terrible. I was homeschooled, relaxed. And I, I mean, I couldn't name one. I didn't know much about it. And I've got it all down now. We talk about government a lot. Open your Bibles to Romans 13. Listen to me carefully. It's okay to debate about government and have government conversations. But can I just say, if we're talking to absolute strangers around us, kicking into conversations about government all the time, and not talking about Jesus, I see water in the boat. We can't let this become our identity in the, in the only way we know how to reach to the outside world. And when we do, let's watch the way we're doing this. Romans 13, you know well, I don't have to go into it too deeply, but in verse 1, even under Roman, oppressive Roman rule, verse 1 says, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. He goes on to explain in verse 4 that they are ministers of God for good. Therefore, verse 5, be in subjection. He's telling him, you, as far as you possibly can, need to be in subjection to Roman government because I am in control and I'm using them to carry out good. Listen to me carefully. I kind of like Facebook and social media and those kinds of things. People have real disdain for it, but people are really honest on those social media platforms. Have you noticed that? I mean, it just all comes pouring out, and at least you find out who people really are. 
There are a lot of what I would call very solid, convicted Christians, song leaders, great people, Bible class teachers, holy, pious, and wonderful, until they get on Facebook and make some comment about our government, until they share some meme that's just absolutely distasteful and usually a complete lie, and perpetuate it to fight for some party or something. And you're saying, well, I haven't seen much of that lately. That's because there's a Republican president. Back up a few years. My own brethren posting things that are despicable. And I'm thinking, wait, wait, wait. Somebody's going to see this. They're going to see what you're posting, sharing, and thinking. And all of this sermon sharing, and all these Bible verses, hashtag blessed, all that stuff, it's gone. Because you saw some meme somewhere that you thought took a shot at somebody who you don't even know. Stand up for your people. My people are Christ's people. And I just want to say that, I'm not saying this is everywhere, but I'm just saying, check it, you know? Just make sure this isn't the thing that's sort of sinking us. Let me give you a couple more here. In the next section, while it wasn't the main question the Sadducees were asking, their main question was about something else, they wrapped it up in this sort of heavily, heavily worded question about a woman married seven times. I would just draw you to Matthew 19. I just want to make a quick point out of this. There are so many questions about marriage today. I've practically been asked this question, except they were all still alive. Well, he married her, and then she married him, 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 and she married him, and, married him, and now she's married to him, and what should she do next? And I mean, I've had the whiteboard out, and I mean, I've needed to call for extra colors. I mean, it's been crazy. We get asked about marriage a lot. Right now, we're being asked about whether marriage is one man, one woman, or some other construct. We're being asked about divorce, and what's the big deal with that, or remarriage, and why does that matter? You need to be educated on marriage. You need to be able to, with gentleness and humility, have a conversation with people about what the Bible... I just gave you Matthew 19. We could have selected lots of passages. But Matthew 19 says quite plainly in verse 9, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality, you know the verse, and marries another woman commits adultery. You kind of need to understand that. You can't just say, well, there's this verse, and I guess. You need to know. Because most of the people that you'll meet will have some complication regarding marriage somewhere in their circle of influence. And what you don't want to do, what you don't want to do, is shine your light, put your boat out on the water, invite people to church, talk about God, draw attention, and the first time marriage comes up, you say something that's completely off base or insulting or unnecessary, and my lack of understanding of marriage ends up running them away before the gospel really has a chance to pierce their hearts. Know about marriage. And really to get to the main question here, and by the way, real picture of heaven. Very hard to find. Very, very hard. Very hard. John was an artist, turns out. We're glad about that. This is a picture of heaven. I love the throne scene. I think about it. I pray about the throne scene a lot. I thought about doing the throne scene lesson tomorrow morning. Probably won't, but you've got the, the elders and the creatures and the spirits and all of this. And people want to know about heaven. Nobody's going to serve God unless they have a picture of where they're going. They want to know about heaven. You're supposed to be serving God because you want to get here. Because you know that this place exists. And you actually know some things about this place. You know what's there and who's there and what it's going to be like. You have Revelation 4 and 5. You have 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. You have a clear picture of what's coming. Can I just tell you that one of the biggest holes in people's boats is they talk about heaven. They don't know how to talk about heaven. They don't know how to to explain why they're living for heaven in the perspective. What I'm telling you is, if you really want to have influence in the world, you're going to need to know some things about heaven so that you can answer some questions. And then we get to these last two. Open your Bible to 2 Timothy, please. These are the same things. I hope you're seeing here. We're just drawing these six things right out of the text in Matthew 22 because things never change. The same hot topics they thought would expose weakness in Jesus, the world hopes will expose weakness in you. And so if it's not something like marriage or what's heaven going to be like, it may just be something like this. They asked him, what's the greatest law? They hoped that he didn't know enough about the law to answer. The Bible tells us, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 and following, that we need to be a people who study, meditate upon, and know the law of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Now, there's a reason why I read that verse first. Everybody knows verse 15. I read that verse first because I think that's what Christians get good at. We get good at just banter about God. 
well, I believe this about God, and I go to this church, and we do this. We sound like everybody else, just throwing religious tag words around. One of the biggest little holes in a Christian's boat is when it's really time to talk about the Bible. It's not just some, hey, how you doing? That's interesting. Throwing buzzwords around. It's actually really time to say, all right, I want to show you something. Christians just haven't done the study. We're good at wrangling, though. Let's fight about something. The verse says, no, look, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Could Jesus accurately handle the word of truth? You guys remember what he did to Satan? He destroyed Satan in the wilderness. I mean, upside down, side dismantled him with what? With Scripture. In Matthew 22, he stopped them in their tracks. You know why they were astonished in Matthew 22? Because they were trying to use his weakness in the law to expose that he was not a man to follow. And he reached back into that law and he shaped it for them in front of them and made it the most beautiful presentation and they knew they were outmatched. Why? Because he knew the law. He could present it, share it. Let me just say, if you're out there inviting people to church, that's awesome. If you're being gentle and humble and caring and kind, that's great. That's so great. We're not undermining any of that. But don't forget that the hard work of studying your Bible at home is really important if you ever want to see any of that turn into something real. Salvation for those people. Don't be weak in that area. And then one last thing. Open your Bibles to James chapter 2. That's the, the sort of graphic you see in the background. James chapter 2. James 2, you know, sometimes, and again, going back to the Pharisees as we get near the end of this, I don't really think they thought that he did not know the law. I mean, they were kind of hoping that he wouldn't know the law when they asked the question. But as I said before, what they really wanted him to do was pick one. Because preferential treatment of God's word would make it easy to divide his base. Say, look guys, if you're in this camp, that's fine. But he doesn't care about the rest of this. And the Bible talks about the danger of that. In James chapter 2 and verse 8. If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, partiality towards the rich and the poor who walked in, that was the mistake that they were making, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. 4 verse 10, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one, he has become guilty of all. Now I'm going to stop there because that sounds a little more ominous than it is. It doesn't mean that if you sin one time, you're out. That's not the point. The point isn't you can do everything right, you do one thing wrong, and you're out of here. What he's saying is you can do everything right, but if you willfully decide to skip one thing, just one thing. Can I just ask you guys, any physics majors in the room? Anybody study physics at higher education? How many holes in the boat is it going to take? Just one. Now you can stare at that hole and go, ooh, hole, water, wow. And you can turn around and just hope that, hey, look, 95% of my boat is fine. I should be fine. What happens to the boat? It sinks. That's what he's talking about here. Look at the rest of my boat. It's perfect. It's one hold. Forget it. It's no big deal. Forget about it. The boat sinks. Now, if you decide to do something about that hole, that's not what he's saying in verse 10. But look at what he says in verse 11. For he who said do not commit murder, and he uses really extreme circumstances here, of course. He who said do not commit murder also said do, or do not commit adultery, also said do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who shows no mercy. And that was his ultimate point, is they weren't showing mercy to the poor man when he came in. And his point is, you can't just ignore one. Now, I'm not going to get off on this. I've got a little time to do it tonight, but I'm not going to do it. But I think there's a big difference between this one back here and this one. This one is just people who aren't spending enough time in the book. You're not learning the message of salvation. This one shows up in a different field of view. This one shows up by people who've been in the church a really, really long time and know the Bible very, very, very well. But somehow over the years, they've majored in things and they've minored in other things. You ever seen that? That's, that's upsetting, isn't it? Uh, one issue for me that I preach a lot about, I had a family here the other day who listened to the series on disfellowship. And the way that individuals pursue disfellowship and what the Bible says about disfellowship and the implications of that in your own family. 
And I believe that there are a lot of really strong Christians who are super serious about really important doctrinal issues and lock down those arguments who are totally missing the boat on that issue over there. We major in this like church organization. And we got this hole over here that we just have failed to give much time to. You can get this just right, but if you ignore that, the boat's only going to go one direction. So here's what we're saying. We're saying that we need to be a people who watches out for what's happening around us. And here are six particular categories that historically Christians who are, who are all together on the right path and trying to do all the most wonderful of things have let just a few little mistakes along the way be a major problem for them. Let's go back to our text as we conclude. We will read this. They asked him all these questions they were pushing, and, and the world does this in varieties of ways. They don't walk up and ask you all these questions. They just stare at you a lot. And they listen for all the words that come out of your mouth, and they check out the clothing that you're wearing. They're watching everything that you're posting because they don't like the stance you've taken for truth. People who don't acknowledge truth don't like those who do. And if you could just mess up once, please, that would be great for them. And they stare and they look. But I want to add something to this. After they were done staring at Jesus, Jesus stared at them. After they were done asking their questions of Jesus, Jesus said, my turn. And in Matthew chapter 22, in verse 41, now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. He said, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord? The Lord said, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Now, again, I've read the whole New Testament about a dozen times and I'm still going, um, I, don't, I think I know what he's talking about here. They had no chance. They had no chance at all. No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. What he's saying is, I am the son of David, and I am the Christ. And if you would stop nitpicking, looking for weaknesses, and seeking to justify your behavior, you would be worshiping me right now, and I would be directing it to my Father. I am the Son of God. Now, you're not going to try that little trick, but i tell you what you can do. Don't forget, you get to ask questions too. Don't forget that. We're not just on defense mode all the time where they're pushing on us. Well, let me push on him here. Let me ask him this question. Let me try this. Don't forget, you get to ask some questions too. Hey, can I ask you something? What does the Bible say about this? Can I ask you something? Why haven't you gone to God about that? Or, or what's your defense for this? They were not able to answer, and his strength shone through. So here's what happened, guys. Hole in the boat. Very cold December water, barely made it back, total mess, got to the bank, pulled that boat was heavy, full of water, pulled it out, stared at it, lamented. I, did I tell you guys I only get to do this every few months or something? I mean, yikes. So it took a while to, to pour it out. That hole, let me tell you, by the way, the water gets in the boat a lot faster than it gets out, just letting you know, through that hole. Anyway, so I, I worked and I, I, I flipped the boat and I poured out all the water. Okay, it was my fault that the water was in there poured out all the water, laid the boat back down, stuck the plug in, and it came right back out. Stuck it in, and I pulled it right back out. So then I stuck it in, and I went and got a log, and it did not come back out. I beat it back in there, and I thought, I guess I'll go home. And I looked out at the water, and the wind is just like, Tch. you know, you fishermen know. And I pushed that boat. I was soaking wet. I didn't care. Had lures everywhere. Threw them all back in the box. I pushed that boat back out on the water. I caught seven bass that night. Yeah, that's a good ending to that story. Seven, I'm not kidding. It's not some perfect number. It was seven. <laughs> seven. I'm making this stuff up. Why am I telling you that? Why am I telling you that? Do you know? Look at the list behind me. It's probably not a, an adult in this room who cannot look at that list and say their shoes are wet. Am I right about that? It happened. Maybe not now, maybe not this moment, but at some point. You know what you do about that? You don't sit there and sink. You get to the shore, you pour the water out, you put the plug back in, and you get back out on the water. Get back out there. Let the world keep pushing. You get back out there. Because there are fish in that water 
that can be brought out from the confines of the world if we just fix it and get back out there. Who's here tonight ready to plug that hole, pour out that water, and get back out there? If you need to repent of something that you've done that maybe has been a bit of a sinking hole for you, and you want to be healed of that, Christ will forgive you. God's people will encourage you. We'll help you plug that thing back in, and we'll do it together. And if you're not a Christian, not much of what we've said tonight has applied to you. Because you haven't even gotten in the boat yet. you got to get in there. You need to know what it looks like when you're above that which seeks to pull you down and you've got a place to go and a reason for living. If you're not a Christian, you can be baptized into Christ. Don't let another night pass without His blessings in your life as we stand and sing.